it on national security issues. We're bringing you live coverage on TTT, Talk City 91.1 FM, and on Facebook at TTT Live Online. We take you now to the Ministry of National Security at Temple Court, Abercrombie Street, for that conference. Good afternoon, members of the media, wider viewing and listening public of Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you all, all, as usual, I must say, for attending this afternoon's media conference. The main issue I have called for this media conference here this afternoon is really to give an update on the exemption system with respect to our border management. You all would recall not so long ago, I announced the introduction of a new online system. So I just wanted to provide a bit of an update. But to do so, I'd like to start by just reminding us, the population, that it was over one year ago this government began dealing with COVID-19. And that was even before it was declared a pandemic. So it was on the 30th of January, 2020, we were the first country in the Western Hemisphere to place travel restrictions on persons who had been to China within a 14-day period before. So that is just a reminder that we were the first country over a year ago to start dealing with it. And we took that at the time it was seen as a drastic measure. In hindsight, of course, we all now understand the benefits that were provided to Trinidad and Tobago by the decisions that we took starting then. Over the next few weeks, we added a list of countries. We added to the list of countries the travel restrictions as to persons who had traveled to certain countries. You all would recall some of the countries at the time. It was South Korea, Japan, Italy, Spain. As we began to see this new virus begin to take foot globally, all of our decisions were made after advice and consultation with our public health experts based on medicine and based on the science available at the time. And at this, pause, I, I, at this point, I'd just like to pause and smile a little bit. As I hear people say that every time you make a decision, it is really an admission that what was before was a failure. That is absolutely not so. The truth and the reality that the globe is facing is a virus. As we continue to say, even as of today, the virus continues, I don't know if mutate is the right word, but there are new variants, new strains of the virus taking place. So anyone who's caught flat-footed, anyone who digs their heels in and is not prepared to evolve their process, they may have more difficulties to deal with. This government, from day one, appointed a three-man committee, a cabinet subcommittee, chaired by the Honorable Prime Minister, including the Minister of Health, Minister Dial Singh, and myself as the Minister of National Security back in March of last year, and entrusted that three-man team to work along with our public health care experts. We consulted not only in Trinidad and Tobago with our public health care experts, but I recall at the time discussions taking place with doctors, scientists abroad, etc. And all of that information then assimilated by this team whose duty is to protect the people and the population of Trinidad and Tobago and to take decisions and to be decisive as the information with respect to the virus continues to come to us across the globe. On March the 12th, 2020, we announced a decision to suspend all cruise ships docking in Trinidad and Tobago. We also, on the 12th of March last year, advised all of our nationals, do not travel unless it is absolutely essential or an emergency. We closed our borders to non-nationals on the 17th of March. You all would recall the first case, the positive case we had of the virus, of course imported, was on the 12th of March last year. We then closed our borders to nationals on the night of the 22nd of March, effective a minute past midnight on the 23rd of March, 2020. We have been managing persons returning to Trinidad and Tobago. That is the process. Our borders are closed, but it doesn't mean that no one can enter, no one can leave. The process is to manage it. And these decisions were all based 
on measures designed to protect the population of Trinidad and Tobago. And I'd just like to take the time this afternoon to put on the record that the government never wanted to keep our nationals out of Trinidad and Tobago. That is a foolish statement to me. Question yourself, why would we want to keep our own nationals out of Trinidad and Tobago? What do we stand to benefit as a government by keeping our nationals out of Trinidad and Tobago? From the day one, we said we'll get all our nationals back, we'll manage the process, and border, border management was always driven by the decision to protect the population in Trinidad and Tobago, because that's, that's where we have the control as a government, in Trinidad and Tobago. So the conversation that certain persons are trying to, to take and the narrative they want to push, that the government wants to keep people out of Trinidad and Tobago, that is not so. We have absolutely no desire to keep a single national out of Trinidad and Tobago. But we do know in the balancing exercise, our job and our duty is to protect the population in Trinidad and Tobago and to manage the entry of our nationals into Trinidad and Tobago and categories of non-nationals. So obviously the management and policies would evolve over time. For example, a few months ago, you all would recall, we introduced the measure of entering Trinidad and Tobago, you have to produce a negative PCR test 72 hours before entry. I remember at the time when we introduced that, there was resistance. There were persons who were unable to get their test results on time and people were saying discard it don't worry with that 72 hour pcr test but we understood the science and what that does is it reduces risk in a time where the virus continues to spread in time when the virus continues to, to to travel and to translate itself from one person to another so that was introduced and now you see some of the largest most sophisticated first world countries in the world following suit months after our border management has been, continues to be, and at this time remains an essential pillar of how we're managing and responding to the global pandemic that is COVID-19. We've seen other countries take border decisions. Australia, New Zealand are the two most infamous that come to mind. You continue to read articles. I was reading an article this morning that in Perth, Western Australia, one person tested positive for the virus, a security guard at a hotel, a quarantine hotel facility, and they went into a complete shutdown in Perth. They have over 100,000 Australian, sorry, it's Australia, 100,000 Australian nationals still trying to get back into Australia. No government wants that. But these are some of the responses to how you deal with COVID-19 and every country will take its own decisions and its own decide its own way how it's going to respond. Recently we saw Canada and the UK take border control after resisting it for over a year. The Canadian Prime Minister coming out and warning nationals do not travel. We saw the introduction last week of a system in the United Kingdom. You have to get permission to leave the United Kingdom. It must be for essential travel. You had the Home Secretary, who's in charge of national security in the United Kingdom, come out and say that she wanted to close the borders in March of last year. These are facts. These are live examples. And I just draw it as comparatives for us all to put in context how the world is responding. We're seeing now in the United States a number of measures being introduced at a national level to deal with the pandemic. And these are countries that have been under strain with their numbers. You're seeing in Germany, lockdowns take place. And across the world, these are some of the decisions that are being taken to protect populations against the spread of the virus as we begin to deal with new variants of the virus. It's important to understand, and we said this from day one, the number of persons we can repatriate at any point in time whilst our borders remain close with a managed exercise of entry is determined by the number of space, by the amount of space rather, we have in quarantine facilities. We've always said that. We do not want to overwhelm a parallel healthcare system. Persons might say, okay, but the parallel healthcare system is not under strain. The system designed to deal with COVID is not under strain. You must always plan for the worst 
and be prepared to handle the best. And that is what we've been doing. You all would recall in September of last year, August of last year, when we had a surge of positive COVID-19 cases, our system began to show signs of, of, of not strain, but the highest amount of numbers. At that time, we lost some of our quarantine repatriation facilities because, of course, health needed step-down facilities, etc. We are always working hand-in-hand -hand with the Ministry of Health to determine how many people can be safely repatriated to Trinidad and Tobago, and we try to do it as quickly as possible. But that is the pillar of the border management. It is determined by the number of spaces of quarantine facility we have for persons repatriation. Because what you want to do is ring fence, especially where there's new variants showing up all over. The last number I heard of the new variants in the United States, it was over 30 states had the new variants. As you all know, we have consistent 10-day rotations of flights from New York, Miami, Canada, Barbados, and persons coming in from all over as we continue to repatriate. Whereas some other people were saying, well, close again. So it's a management of your quarantine facilities. We have also had state quarantine facilities where the state, us, the taxpayers, are paying for persons to be quarantined and state supervised quarantine facilities where persons pay for their own quarantine. Other countries now introducing it. You saw the United Kingdom talk about using the hotels near to their airports to quarantine people. The Canadian Prime Minister saying persons coming in now have to pay for quarantine for a number of days at a minimum cost of 2,000 Canadian dollars. Australia only, you can only pay for 14 days quarantine. There's no state, super, state super, um, quarantine facility. So these are the different reactions. And the system has worked. Every country determines its own response. From very early o'clock, we announced that we would be dealing with the oil and gas sector. Oil and gas and our energy sector are the lifeblood of our economy. We are dealing with international, multinational oil and gas companies in Trinidad and Tobago. We worked with them from day one. I remember the meeting one Saturday morning with all of the energy companies, CEOs, and working out with them the various health protocols to keep it going. And them at the time, because nobody knew how this virus was going to take off, saying that they, they didn't know if they would have to shut down facilities or how they would have to deal with it, etc. We worked out protocols and we have kept our oil and gas economy going throughout our reaction and our response to the pandemic. We've also, as things started to, we became more aware, we became more aware how to respond, we take decisions, it's evolving. We started to deal with our manufacturing side of the economy. Manufacturers started to keep their business. You all will remember we went into a stay at home, almost a complete lockdown in April of last year. Coming out of that, manufacturers then began to say we have to bring in people to, to fix our plant, to do maintenance work, etc., etc. And we began dealing with and have continued to deal with manufacturers. Scores and scores of manufacturers, including up to this morning, approving a number of requests from manufacturers who are upgrading their equipment, maintaining their equipment, have emergency situations, we have continued to allow. But two of the absolute conditions, you must pay for their quarantine so it does not affect our repatriation process on our state quarantine facilities, and they must be quarantined when they get here to Trinidad and Tobago, or we work out a protocol with the Ministry of Health where we're satisfied, for example, in the oil and gas sector, that they quarantine in facilities outside of Trinidad and Tobago, present their negative PCRs before they even board the plane. When they arrive, we test them here again, and, and that is how we've been dealing with it. Another category throughout, the diplomats. From the date that we close our borders to now, we have had a number of diplomats who have been granted exemptions. And diplomats who have been granted exemptions to come to go from the United States, Canada, Germany, Japan, the Dominican Republic, Barbados, St. Vincent, Australia, China, Brazil, the Netherlands, Panama, Spain, the European Union, Barbados, Colombia, the United Kingdom, India, Italy, Armenia, Nigeria, South Africa, and Qatar. And those are the diplomats. We have also had a number of requests from 
international bodies, for example, the World Bank, the UN, all of these bodies, and we work with them. It's not a question of choosing them over our nationals. The world must continue somehow to find balance, and that's what we have done here in Trinidad, respecting our international obligations. Early o'clock, we had to deal with the, the Vienna Convention. And what it says is once persons arrive here, they are treated as though they are on their own soil. And we are to respect that. The same way our diplomats are respected are we. And what that meant is working our protocols, provide us with the negative PCR tests. When you arrive here, they are put into a bubble and they are taken to predetermined, prearranged, pre-approved, sometimes their residence, etc. For them to then quarantine. They're not allowed to just go and drift all over Trinidad and Tobago because we said we don't want the spread of the virus that way. And that has gone on. We have had diplomats, we have had, for example, the Americans make a number of requests and been granted to leave Trinidad to go to Guyana. You all will remember when um, Secretary of State Pompeo was going to Guyana, we had a number of Americans, they wanted to go and they come back. Absolutely nothing abnormal with that. They are not the only ones. From day one, we had systems in place. Because obviously, if you're going to have border management, you have to have a system for persons to apply, a system to consider the applications, a system to grant the exemptions. It started off at the outset because we were all new to this. And nobody knew how long this was going to take. As the Prime Minister reminds us, when we first started dealing with it, in March of last year, the world said, well, by September 2020, we should back, be back to some level of normalcy. Everybody was saying, okay, by fall, we'd be back to normalcy. We now know how it unfolded. We started off our system of exemption applications by persons actually emailing the permanent secretary at the Ministry of National Security and the Minister of National Security. That's how we started off initially with a system like that until we very quickly realized the numbers. And I want to put this on the record. From day one, as minister, I have always involved the public service. I have always made sure that the permanent secretary, and at certain stages, the deputy permanent secretary at National Security are involved in the process. I recall when we began closing the border, and I've given this story before, and flights were leaving. You all would remember that weekend where over 12,000 of our nationals returned in a short space of time, over a 72-hour period, if I remember correctly. We were getting calls and email from persons at the counter who may not have had their, their Trinidad and Tobago passports, etc. And it was a permanent secretary and myself. You will never see any letter signed by the Minister of National Security. That's why it's a bit of a joke every time persons hold up these exemptions and think they bust in a mark. It is protected because it is a public service participating. And it is always signed by the permanent secretary. The minister plays a role, the public service plays a role. So the system started off by emailing the minister and the permanent secretary. It then moved to dedicated email, one for those who wanted to depart, that's travel exemption at mns.gov.tt. Those who want, sorry, who wanted to depart was depart exemption. Those who wanted to enter travel exemption. When we set up those email system, we then put a team of young people in place, supervised by the permanent secretary and a deputy permanent secretary. And what they did is extract the information from the email, put it into spreadsheets and a database. I had to smile again over the weekend when I saw a certain editorial criticizing saying, well, why didn't the Minister of National Security have the data extracted and put it into spreadsheets so you could know the information? Obviously, that is what was done. But even when that is done and the email system becomes flooded and persons continue, and I understand the anxiety, so it's not a criticism of people who just sat there pressing send, 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 and it's the same email coming, but it is the reality of what you have to face on the other end and the extraction of the information. And at the time when those, that information was extracted, we sat down, I sat down with the team and we developed the criteria that you all are all now familiar with. At the outset, the first priority were those persons who were stuck outside, who had got caught outside. You had gone for a short vacation and the borders closed on you. So obviously you only went expecting to be outside of Trinidad and Tobago for a few weeks and then now you're facing being stuck outside. 
and that was our first priority. And in that prioritization, as I've said before, it was the elderly, it was the sick, it was those with young children and babies, families, and we went down the line. And that was done by using the information extracted from the email and the spreadsheet system, which worked for us. The team was expanded. Over time, obviously, it evolved. I'm using the word evolve very often because it has to evolve. So as soon as you begin to think you've cleared those who are genuinely stuck outside who had gone on short trips, you can now move to the students, for example. Because then you began having students who were studying abroad now caught in a situation where they began to want to come home. So we had to find a way to facilitate them. Eventually in October or November of last year, October around November last year, vast majority of those who were stuck outside on the short trips and students had been cleared and at that stage the Prime Minister announced that we would add more numbers and some people, some people, we said so from the outside, would be now permitted to come home for Christmas. We also said, because we knew not everybody would be able to come home for Christmas, categories of people seeking to return. One, those who were caught outside by the closed borders who went for short trips. That was our priority. Two, their category a person, persons who go out for months and then return. We all know. We all may have family members like that. They go out. Some may have green cards or other um, documents that allow them to stay in a foreign country for over six months. They go out. They spend time outside. They come back in. And I'm not criticizing any single category of people. I'm just stating the fact that there are different categories that exist. Three was our students. Students wanted to come home. Some, as soon as they arrived home, wanted to go back. Right now, I can tell you all that I'm facing as some of our students went back to North America, went to the UK, went to Ireland, and things shut down, they now want to make their way back. And we will facilitate as best as we can. Four, those who live away and lost their jobs. This became a very large number very quickly. And even in that category, there were two categories of persons. We have Trinidadians who went away and were working illegally and we all know that exists under the table working illegally and they would have been amongst the first to start losing their jobs as the world was affected by COVID-19 and then you had those who chose to live their lives away in a foreign country as Trinidadians and they may have lost their jobs or for other reasons determined that they wanted to come home we know that we have 330,000 Trinidad and Tobago passport holders and this is worth repeating the next category we had, as soon as Carl started flying out, there were persons jumping on the planes going out. Those persons want to come back. So that's the fifth category of persons, those who decided they want to come back home. You then had, sorry, those who decided they wanted to come back home because we actually had persons who were living their lives away and just decided, look, the best place for them is Trinidad and Tobago. And I've received a number of applications like that that they've decided to come back and make their lives in Trinidad and Tobago. They no longer want to be. And you can understand that because the virus is raging in certain places. We have been looking at international television and seeing hospitals under strain. We've never had that problem in Trinidad and Tobago. Then sixth category is those who are coming, accustomed to visiting Trinidad and Tobago. Trinese always want to come home. They come home for Christmas, they come home for Easter, they come home to visit their parents, they come home to visit family, they come home for Carnival now. So you have that category. It's a real category and they too are applying to come home. The seventh category is as soon as Carl started the repatriation flights, we now have a new category of persons. Those who are leaving on those flights and expect a quick turnaround to come home. All of these categories form the pool of persons who want to return and should return to Trinidad and Tobago at some stage in a managed process. Add to that the oil and gas sector, the manufacturing sector, those persons who need to come in for various reasons. We also have other categories. Throughout of this, this whole management have been contacted by the prime ministers of other CARICOM countries asking for certain national students, persons who have fallen ill to come to Trinidad and Tobago for treatment, their students to come in, and their prime ministers, prime minister of Antigua, the prime minister of St. Lucia, the prime minister of St. Vincent, and the Grenadines have been in contact, constant contact 
with the governments of Jamaica, of Barbados, Prime Minister of Grenada, and these things are facilitated once it doesn't prevent our nationals from coming back. Another area, the oil, and, the oil sectors in Guyana and Suriname are taking off. Trinidad and Tobago has excellent service providers in those sectors. From day one, we've worked with our local companies and allowed them the repatriation through Suriname and, and Guyana. You all will recall at the outset, in the early persons stuck in Guyana and Suriname, we've managed working with some of these service providers now to have that flow of our nationals going and coming and facilitating other international companies through Trinidad as well. The online system was announced right here on the 20 sec Friday, the 22nd of January. On that date, I'd given you all certain figures and statistics, and this is where it gets interesting for me. I'd said, as at the 21st of January, which was the day before, there were a certain number of applications that had been made by persons that come in Trinidad and Tobago. So you all would recall, I said there were 19,941 applications to enter Trinidad and Tobago, as at that Friday came before you all. At that stage, we had granted 11,682 exemptions. So it meant there were 8,259 outstanding applications. 8,259 applications. We announced a new system, an online system from Monday. Credit to all of the people who worked hard along with us, our IT persons, our young people, iGov. The system was launched on Monday. I had people asking what would be the cost of the system. No cost to taxpayers. What if we were worried the system would collapse? Fortunately, the system didn't collapse. So I was most interested to know at the end of the first day how many applications would have been received on our online system. Understanding on the Friday before there was this figure of 8,259 outstanding applications. 8,259 persons trying to get in to Trinidad and Tobago. By the end of the first day, we had received 1,676 applications. 1,676 as opposed to the 8,000 the Friday before. I said, okay, let's see what happens by the end of the second day because that would be a good test. Those persons who really, genuinely, legitimately know they can fill out these boxes because there were a lot of questions in this online form, how many there would be by the end of the second day. By the end of the second day, there were 2,171 applications. I said, okay, let's wait a week. I'll come and tell the country what's happened after a week. By the eighth day, so I added another day. So by the eighth day, which was yesterday, the 1st of February, we've received 3,260 applications. And I'll tell you all shortly some of the persons, the types of people applying and what's happening to add to those numbers. So as at Friday, 22nd of January, you had 8,259 applications outstanding. These thousands of people, and I've noticed certain people saying they're tens and twenties of thousands of people outside, not true. As at close of business yesterday, we have 3,260 applications. Now, by the end of the second day, which I now use as a test as to how many people really genuinely legitimately qualified etc and wanted to come home in the shortest period of time 2171 i minus that figure from the 8259 and i'm asking where have the 6088 applications gone so you had a system showing 8000 plus persons now that you're required to sign a statutory declaration swear a statutory declaration that the information is correct Put in your passport details and it cannot be duplicated and answer a number of questions. For example, when did you leave Trinidad and Tobago? Are you normally domiciled in Trinidad and Tobago? Where would you like to enter Trinidad and Tobago from, etc.? We're now down to 3,260 applications. And I just want to talk about some of the cases that we're seeing now so people understand that despite all the hysteria, all the propaganda, we are not really dealing with tens of thousands of Trinidadians stuck outside of Trinidad and Tobago. We're not dealing with thousands of Trinidadians stuck outside of Trinidad and Tobago, meaning 
They went for a period of time and they found themselves stuck outside when the borders were closed. The vast majority, if not all of those persons, have been facilitated. Some may be stuck in far off jurisdictions. We're looking at it, we have one application from Fiji. We have Trinidadians all over the world and throughout the process we've managed that. The point is that from 8,000 plus, we came down eight days later to 3,000 applications. We have persons, and these are some of the persons that we're seeing filling this 3,000. Persons who left in October, November, and December of last year, wanting to come back in. There are cases where persons were outside of Trinidad and Tobago. They were granted approval to return to Trinidad and Tobago. We are still in a global pandemic. In my view, you should only travel if it's necessary, essential, or an emergency. We have cases of persons who came back in and then decided to jump on a plane and left and went back outside and then now are screaming that they have to come back in immediately when we're still now dealing with a prioritization of those who have gone out before them. That's one category. You have people now who are applying, and I understand, people who are applying to leave months from today. Persons who are saying, I want to go in May, I want to go in September, I want to go in June of this year, and they have applied. So all of that now filters in to the 3,000 applications because they're saying, I want to leave and I want to come back in. My child got accepted to university. I want to take the whole family up and come back in. I want to go up for graduation and come back in. I want to go up for, I'm accustomed to seeing my mother, my sister, my brother in so-and-so country. I want to go and come back in. So all of that is filtering in to the 3,000 number and nothing is wrong with any of those applications. I'm just giving you this information so you understand and you have a flavor for what it is that we're dealing with. But in my view, in a pandemic, I strongly suggest travel only if necessary. There are now new contagious, more contagious variants out there. We, I've told people, we cannot predict where this is going to end up. We cannot predict or give any level of certainty, even with the vaccine, what is going to happen. So asking for months from now, there's no way I can tell anybody with certainty Yes, apply now for months down the road because I don't know where our border situation will be. Two months from now, three months from now, etc. But those numbers are in our system. You have persons who are applying saying, look, I went out to get my green card. And now that situation is finished. I got my green card. Here's my Trinidadian passport. I'm ready to come home. Again, nothing wrong with that. But that can't be the priority over others. And it is always difficult finding the balance and prioritizing because as I say, we wish everybody could just come and go as they please, but we can't allow that because you're still dealing with a pandemic with more contagious variants popping up everywhere. People who are accustomed to coming home for Christmas, for carnival, the number of requests we're getting now, my parents are sick, my elderly parents, I want to see them. My parents need my help. My brother needs my help. My sister needs my help. Again, no criticism of those categories, but these are some of the numbers filling the 3,000 applications being made. When we looked at a first glance of those who have applied, it comes up that there are about 1,500 persons who left before the borders were closed in March. Even in this category, which we're now verifying with immigration, there are persons who are custom going out. There also we've picked up Persons who were domiciled in the United States and other areas, so they would have obviously left before March in ticking that box in, in the online system, but they lived outside and they now want to return for one reason or the other. Our priority, immediate priority, is through the online system because that allows us to filter, and it's not that the old system did not have the information as well, but this new online system makes it easier and we've applied a waiting category W-E-I-G-H-T, as to how we deal with the various applications being made. Let me just finish giving you all these statistics. As at the 1st of February, in addition to the numbers I gave you all, 
we have now granted as at the 1st of February 12,338 applications exemption sorry for persons to enter Trinidad and Tobago so as at yesterday we had granted 12,338 the last time I'd given you all a figure on the 22nd of January it was 11,682 so you'd see in that less than two week period we've granted hundreds of exemptions and we're now looking to see how we can speed that up even more but as I say it is always contingent on the ability to quarantine people on entry into Trinidad and Tobago <clears throat> some of the waiting that, that the online system has built into it is if the applicant has medical issues now I know once I give this information people will start ticking the box if an applicant is 12 years and under if an applicant is 60 years and over if the applicant will pay for quarantine the reasons that they traveled when they went out are they living abroad we have persons who went out for conferences in, the, in this day and age for holidays vacations and these are some of the things that are filtering into the system now just to let you all know what has always been generated are the lists by the public the public servants in the system the team so they were always given how to categorize they put together the list as I've always maintained there's a discretion in the system to allow us because they're going to be emergency circumstances they're going to be occasions when you want to add names to the list so that has just continued now to give the population a little bit of an understanding as to what has been faced and what is going on we have a lot of conscientious people who provide information so I'm constantly having provided to me information from certain chat groups screenshots of chat groups and it is extremely disturbing what you see on these chat groups and the misinformation being given by certain persons on these chat groups and I wouldn't call their names here today they know who they are and now they're trying to garner support and opening accounts to bring class actions against the government etc but what was instructive to me is over time that the the applicants or the persons involved in those chat groups they've all come back home so now is the rabble rousers and the mischief makers and those who want to be relevant and they say the most heinous things on these chat groups and over time unfortunately I've seen them even say well look I'm going to reach out to this member of the media that member of the media they want to do stories this member of the media as a family member but he don't want to talk about his family member so he will use other examples can we give those examples we're seeing that consistently being done nothing wrong I've always said freedom of the press is important but I've also always warned don't be used by a tool of the mischievous it is very easy another thing you're seeing is on the social media you're seeing the comments well I'm stuck outside for months my business is collapsing a quick research done and not by me because I have absolutely no interest in it the information is brought to me the persons live abroad they live in the United States their businesses in the United States etc but for whatever reason they just want to create this mass hysteria I've given you all the information from day one I've given you all the information the statistics the numbers that is a little example of what's going on another one that I recently exposed litigation being brought by members of the opposition there's one particular example I'm gonna give here today a former attorney general issuing a pre-action letter to someone who is already granted approval to come home so when the person contacted we said but hold on we have here a pre-action letter please have in, instruct your attorney not to pursue any action because you're coming home you're on the next flight to come home the, we have the written instructions from the person to the former attorney general saying I do not want to pursue action against the state please withdraw the action it hadn't gone anywhere no action had been filed etc then to be told that that former attorney general told the family if you don't pursue the action you have to pay me $350,000 in legal fees putting the family under that kind of pressure and strain a real example and that happened there's another example a woman stuck in the British Virgin Islands granted an exemption of course there are no flights directly eventually she gets back 
the touting that went on for her then to pursue action against the state. There was one recently I spoke about in Parliament, and my intention in the Parliament was not to choose on the applicant. And as it turned out, the lady did not even have an application. Let me explain to the population that example, where a UNC MP is a lead attorney. We received the pre-action letter via the media. I was in practice for many years, 18 years before getting this, never once leaked anything as an attorney to the media. But there, is, there, there seems to be this modus operandi. So the first I saw of the pre-action was when it came across the news and in the newspaper. Days later, get the pre-action letter from the attorneys demanding and saying they're going to sue the state if we don't lift the border control immediately, disband the border control, and grant our client is not interested in coming home. Don't, don't worry to grant an exemption. Because she's not interested in coming home. The state retained senior counsel. The state's attorneys wrote to the attorneys, kindly provide evidence of your client's application because they said in their letter she applied since July 2020. They never, up to this date, they are unable to provide the evidence of an application. What they sent was an email from A to B and nowhere in there is the Ministry of National Security. Still said, go ahead and I granted the exemption for the person to come home, but demanded that you provide evidence of application being made. We checked our system twice. There was never an application being made. But consistent, the storyline, consistently running to the media. And I understand that, but I want the population to be aware of the mischief that is taking place. And I saw even after I raised it in Parliament, the goalpost shift. The goalpost shifted, so it was no longer well, my client did not apply. It was now, why is the minister exposing this? I'm still going to sue the minister and I'm still going to attack the border control. The point is you lied. The point is an application was never made. But you want to create hysteria. I am not afraid of court. I have court clothes. In fact, I'm begging to put back on my robes and go to court. So these are some of the examples of the type of mischief that we're facing and the difficulties that we're facing. Again, I see the goalpost shift. As I explained, the diplomats from day one, we worked out in accordance with international obligations and domestic law, how they would be. I listed the number of countries, and I could, the number of countries that diplomats have come and some have gone and come back, etc. Manufacturing, the same thing. So I've given some examples of what has taken place, how the new system is performing, and the new system is not any admission of the failure of the previous system. The day we stop evolving, the day we stop making things better, something has gone wrong, and we will continue to do so at national security. Everyone is entitled to their opinion. We do not want any Trinidadian to be stuck outside, and we are dealing with the applications as we've shown you all. We will continue to do the best that we can to deal with the applications being made and what is necessary to protect, most importantly, the population inside Trinidad and Tobago. So members of the media, that is the information I wanted to provide you all with today. An update a week later on how our online system is, is performing and is performing well. Even with the online system, over the last week, we found certain areas we can tweak, certain improvements we're going to make as we go along, and we will continue to do so. At this stage, I'll take some questions. If you all have any questions. All right, good. Are we taking any questions on Andrea? On... Yeah, let me mic come in. News day. Um, thank you for the transparency hour, I think it was, that, that you, transparency that you gave us in the last hour. And keeping in that vein, um, touching the last point that you raised in terms of litigation, <coughs> can you say how much money the state has spent so far in addressing these issues? That, that will have to be directed to the Attorney General's Department. Okay. Also, if you are aware, um, how many attorneys have the state 
um, routine routine to deal with uh, these matters again I am not certain I know of at least three senior counsel I'm not sure whether external junior counsel have been retained what I can say so far we've been successful in all of the matters I've asked the Attorney General to make sure and pursue costs I've been begging that we use something called wasted cost. Wasted cost is where the court makes an order that the attorneys have to pay the costs out of their own pocket. And if I were an attorney for the state, that's the course of action I would be pursuing. And who are these um, senior counsels that were retained? I know of three. I mean, we don't usually give the names, but Reginald Armour, Fayad Hussein, and Douglas Mendes. I have a whole list of questions I, I want to share, but I want to get my questions asked as share. well. I think you should share. Share the mic now and we'll come back to your questions. Let me just ask one or two more. Um, given all that you've said there, um, with, uh, with <coughs> people being outside, being domiciled for a while, and now wanting to come home, um, some have been arguing that they are not getting exemptions can be seen as vindictive, even spiteful. Uh, how would you respond to that? I don't know who they're aiming the vindictiveness and the spitefulness at. It is up to the Minister of National Security in accordance with the law. As I've tried to explain, as a minister, I don't look at every application and now with the online system. What I can see, there has never been an instance of vindictiveness or spitefulness, in, including, as the record will show, persons who have been suing the government, who have gone that far, they still get the exemptions to come in. Every single, you know, I kept meaning, to, thanks for this opportunity. Every single opposition MP's letter that I have received, I have immediately dealt with with the public servants. So there is absolutely no level of vindictiveness on my part on the government's part, we just don't get into that. As I say, if you understand the principle that we don't want any Trinidadian to be outside, and we're trying our best to get everyone inside. So I reject that. Um, switching to the online application now, uh, you said there was some 3,000 plus that, that yeah, fell that, off. That, that is, no, 6,000 plus 6, fell 000 off. 6,088. Fell off. Um, why do you think this happened and do you think uh, people are frustrated by the system and they no longer have faith in the system is why they, they fell off? Being frustrated by the system, not having faith in the system is not going to get you into Trinidad and Tobago. So assuming you want to come to Trinidad and Tobago, you have to use the online system. I also recall at the outset when we t launched the online system, person saying it's unfair because those who applied before will lose their, their line in the queue. We are also work those metrics, and that, that's not going to happen. So I could only assume why those 6,000 applications no longer exist, as good as you can assume. Uh, Minister, just um, also wondering, in the context of the, the numbers, um, and in terms of the issue of the state's capacity to quarantine, because you said that's a critical aspect of it, uh, are you satisfied, given what you are seeing now, that the state is in a position to quarantine an increase in the number of persons coming in? We, we have increased the quarantine facilities, especially on the state-supervised quarantine side. So a number of, of facilities have been added. And at this stage, you're working on, when you look at other jurisdictions, everyone has to pay for quarantine, but you're also realizing that the persons now who are going and coming, etc., they really should pay for their own quarantine facilities. Those who are genuinely stuck and stranded outside, we've dealt with their back home, thankfully, and, but we continue to understand that we still have to have some level of state, super, state quarantine facilities because there may be those who, who may not be able to afford. And there are not many jurisdictions that do it that way, but we will continue to maintain that. Well, once the distribution of the AstraZeneca vaccine begins and is ongoing, uh, is there a threshold number that would cause the government to revisit the issue of the border closure? I don't think it's going to be based necessarily on the vaccination, because of course the vaccination, it really depends on vaccination outside. 
but the government is continuously discussing, looking at it, making decisions, etc. And we will continue to do so. I, there's no way I'm going to step out and say what the government is going to do. I am only one of three of that sub-cabinet committee, always meeting with the Prime Minister, always in constant discussion with the Prime Minister, the Minister of Health, and other colleagues as we go along. Has that committee also been looking at, uh, for example, the last surge <coughs> occurred last year, and that was not too, not uh, just around after the period of the last general election. We had the elections in Tobago. We've had uh, people going back and forth, of course, uh, during that period. Any concerns coming out of the THA election campaign period? Again, that will be guided by, by, by the numbers we see. I've been monitoring the numbers. And we're actually going to be meeting tomorrow with the health experts to have some discussion, etc. But at this stage, no, I haven't heard any concern raised, nor have I seen the numbers start to rise. Why else you all are packed? Yeah, just okay, let me just use the opportunity. There was one other issue that I said I would deal with today. So whilst Ms. Buram is getting the mic, allow me the opportunity. I have had a number of questions raised about the immigration and about the computer system at immigration, including by the opposition suggesting that there's been some change in the immigration system. Let me explain to the population what the change is. You would remember when we went into our stay at home in April of last year, I announced that we were going to use the opportunity at immigration to upgrade the computer system and the software, hardware and software systems at immigration. That was done. What it allows is a different level of security. So whereas before every man jack, as they say, had access to all of the immigration information, which is a dangerous thing in the first place. It allowed now immigration to administratively decide who has access to what and to, in to integrate different tiers of security to get into different points in the system. That is all that it is. And I, as a minister, had absolutely nothing to do with deciding who has access to what. I'm not interested. What I did ask immigration to do is use the opportunity to deal with the allegations of corruption. So if you have a system and now you have to actually securely enter into the system, I was told that to get into certain areas and stuff, you have to use your fingerprint, literally. That's a good thing. So the little noise and the little chatter and the little leakage suggesting that persons no longer have access and they can't pick up red flag people coming in, absolute rubbish. Those who need access to know who is red flag coming in have that access and it's never stopped. So those who make any noise, in my view, are the ones to watch. Because the ones who may have administratively no longer have access to certain areas have a problem with that. Well, maybe the authorities need to be asking you what you have a problem with that for. There have been a number of deportation exercises. That was the last fuss and hubbaloo where they were telling persons in the media misleading them that we can't deal with the deportation exercise because we don't have access. It's, we know in advance who is being deported to Trinidad and Tobago. We were working with the U.S. State Department, the ICE, that we all know ICE out of the United States as to who's coming in. We ran the background searches. Those in authority who needed to have the information have it. We immediately housed them for their quarantine somewhere separate. So absolutely nothing has been. And, and the opposition's attempt to say after... Vice President Delcy came, young interfere with the system, completely untrue, as is usual. So thanks. I, I will try to expand on Jules' question as much as is possible, which is to say, <coughs> taking the thing day by day, which government has to do, or week by week, the only real thing the species has control of in this pandemic is how well individuals adhere to the public regulations. Other than that, I think the Prime Minister is fond of using the term pear-shaped. So if the rest of the world begins to go absolutely pear-shaped, I mean, what is the real plan for the thousands of people stuck outside, whoever they may be? Okay, let's pause there. There are not thousands of people stuck outside. So you have 330,000 Trinidadians who may want to rush home, and that's what we're protecting against. We've said, and I have the numbers here, I mean, you all would have heard, I always use as at the 29th of July how many applications there were made to come in. And I use that as the persons who may have been stuck 
outside, right? And at the time, that was 5,000. Let me get the exact figure for you. As at the 29th of July, 5,539 applications. I've just told you all that as at today, 12,338 exemptions have been granted. So you're more than double that amount. So there is no category of people who are stuck outside. There are persons who, for different reasons, want to come back to Trinidad and Tobago. I've tried to give you all. In, I've given you all the numbers and tried to show the correlation with these numbers. And I mean, even by going to the online system now, and six thousand people dropping off. So we will continue to manage the borders. We'll continue to be guided by our public health experts and scientists. So I can tell you, the experience of the last year. There's a lot of uncertainty. So decisions that we may be deciding today can change depending on how the virus takes off a week, two weeks from now. Jensen, I think just pass the mic down. Nice. I'll have a special Q&A session with um, Jensen. <laughs> um, I was just uh, curious as to since the repatriation... Can you identify yourself, please? Nadaline Singh, uh, CL Communications. I just wanted to find out, since the repatriation process started um, last year till now, um, can you gauge whether or not it has improved and whether what are some of the, the things that you have improved on? And then secondly, is there still a problem with the migration issue or immigrant issue coming from Venezuela? All right. I think the answer to the first question must be yes. As I say, we're evolving. If we're evolving, I'm hoping we're evolving in a positive, a positive fashion and manner. So as we've had to deal with different things, yes, it has improved. We've in, increased the amount of quarantine space and types of quarantine, how we're dealing with it, the online system, etc. So the answer is yes. Things in Venezuela haven't changed. Persons have always been migrating to Trinidad from Venezuela. We continue to have a closed border. They continue to have a closed border. We continue to be in touch with their authorities. We continue to do what we need to do on our side as best as we can and continue to do what we can to protect our borders. What impact, if any, um, does the Canadian decision to ban? I mean, it's not going to stop our repatriation. God, that was another our repatriation exercise, right? So, so Cal can continue to do the flight, so we'll continue to manage that. The Canadian authorities haven't reached out to us and told us that we cannot continue to, to do our exercises, so we'll continue to do so. So I don't, I think the effect is gonna have a, for some of the other islands where there were direct flights. I saw Air Canada, Sunwing, um, WestJet, and some of these airlines will no longer be flying. But thanks as you remind me about Canada, there's some other information I wanted to give you all. The farm workers, mm -hmm. the farm workers who went out to work in the farms up in Canada and then those who were already there when the borders were closed and those who demanded to go and signed waivers that if you leave, understand you'll be subject to whatever our border controls are. You all would remember that. These are the statistics. Very interesting. 490 of our nationals traveled to Canada on that whole farm worker program for the 2020 season, 490. 257 have returned to Trinidad and Tobago. 229 workers decided to remain in Canada. We had persons who had been approved, we had arranged PCR tests for, they arrive at the counter to come on the flight and then decide, nah, I stay in. Again, I have no problem with that. Those are persons personal decisions. Population, just put on a marker here today, that 229 nationals, when we de dedicated two flights to bring back our nationals, 229 have decided to stay up there. You see what's going on in Canada. I just wanted to give that information as well. Um, sticking in that vein of the 12,338 exemptions granted, um, <coughs> Can you say how many people actually returned to Trinidad and Tobago? I don't have that exact figure. And with the new system, uh, you're supposed to say when you left the country, um, have you received any applications? Some people would have left a year ago. 
or just about yes. the time that yeah, the, yeah. the border was closed. There, there are because you're seeing people saying, "Look, I left in October 2019, November 2019," but they fall into one of those categories that I've said they may be domiciled away or their custom going up, spending a number of months wherever it is they are: United Kingdom, Canada, the United States, staying with family members or whoever it is, and then coming back. And those who are playing um, playing hopscotch coming in and, and, and going out, what's the shortest or longest, shortest period that we have seen people leave and wanting to return? One month, a week, two days? You're getting a number of different requests. I mean, it, 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 it really depends. But now I've asked with this new online system to focus on it some more to make sure that those who went out for a longer period, they're the priority as opposed to the hopscotchers, as you put it. And you mentioned also that you're granting exemptions for those coming in for the manufacturing sector. I think it's tomorrow. Well, if no, I mean, this, up to this morning, even now, uh, before I came in here, I see there were some more applications. Our manufacturing sector and our business sector continue to have a need for technicians to come in and do maintenance, upgrade work, and this type of thing. Do you have a, a figure? No, I don't have a figure for that. I'd ask them to compile that. And lastly, I think you touched on it as well. <laughs> I think this is my last question. Um, with regards to the whole system, what you also mentioned that you work in tandem with the Deputy P Permanent Secretary as well as the Permanent, Permanent Secretary. Secretaries. And what role, if any, does the Minister himself play in this entire exemption process? Okay, at the end of the day, the law is that the Minister must approve. So they, the system would churn up the list. So, for example, you have a flight coming in of 150, 130, they produce a list, and then the minister will approve the list. But on the assumption that they have gone through the various criteria, etc., there may also be other occasions where, as, as a ministerial discretion, that you would, I would grant, or I'd say, look, I want you to approve this person, this person's mother is very sick, or, or something has happened, etc. That is really the rule. But I ultimately take the responsibility for it. But I've tried to distance, especially that's why you have the online system. This is your last question, right? Yes, I, I hope so. Um, given your involvement, your, your political person, um, do you think that your involvement may taint the process politically? Given my political person, do I think no? No, you are, you are a politician. No. Yes, yes, I am an elected member of parliament and a politician, but no, my, my involvement in the system, me personally, has not tainted anything. But the view is there. If what? The view is there. They'll always have different views. I, I will have to go back to the Blue Waters exemptions because there's <coughs> a stench lingering on it. And... Uh, you are in the process of addressing these perceptions of unfairness, victimization. But just to go back to it, because we are seeing a lot of people in the business sector saying, well, what about me? I've been waiting, you know, I, I, I'm just getting blank and my, my business is going down and I need this person to come in to see about this for me. And can we just go back to that maybe and try to clear some Absolutely. of that? Absolutely. I am not seeing, first of all, there is no stench from where I sit. But and secondly, the public, the public perception is. Well, is public perspe perception is very often influenced by various things. But you are saying that you have examples of businessmen who are saying that they want someone to come in for their business purpose and they've gotten blanked and they haven't gotten anything, if you have those examples, send it to us here and it will be addressed. Because there is now a very specific email set up for that. It's corp, C-O-R-P, travel exemption, one word, corp travel exemption, at mns.gov.tt. I think again what you have, and when I looked into some of these comments online, or it was looked into and the information sent for me and not by anybody in national security, by members of the public. Those are persons just trying to create mischief, right? I have a small business, I want to come home and this type of thing. Fine if it's legitimate, but that is not fitting into the category that I've just described. And I mean, I don't know how Blue Waters got picked on. At the end of the day, that's not my concern because I know that the system is transparent and that very, 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 very many businesses across the whole spectrum of Trinidad and Tobago for months and months and months have been granted exemptions 
the technicians to come in and do the work that is needed to be done, including, for example, in the medical sector, when we needed persons to come in and address and fix equipment in our medical sector, both private and public, etc. Mr. Young, Charlene Rampersad from CNC3. Um, we received an allegation that there was a Coast Guard officer who in December would have broken... There was a what officer, sorry? Coast Guard, mm -hmm. sorry. Would have broken out two Venezuelan women from a quarantine base at the heliport. Can you confirm or deny that? You, you received information that there was a Coast Guard officer that... Okay, I'll have to look into that. Um, can we switch to the matter of Andrea Barrett now? Well, I wasn't coming here to address the matter of Andrea Barrett, but, I mean, it is something that is public. It is something that all of us, I, I would hope, are concerned about it. I certainly am, as I've been since it came to my, my attention on Saturday morning. So I'll allow a few questions on it, yes. Right, so last year after the murder of Ashanti Riley, we would have seen the police commissioner call, send, issue a call for women to be allowed to carry pepper spray for their own protection. Is there any update you could give us, to any consideration you would have made towards that call? So government doesn't do things by VAPS, whim, fancy, and reactive and emotional, as well, a government shouldn't, let me put it that way. So what I have done and what I requested from specialists is a report and a suggestion with respect to policy and a comparison of what takes place in other jurisdictions. I have finally received that report, and that report will be discussed at the National Security Council, will then take a decision. Do we have any sort of timeline for, for that decision? It is not a, a very simple decision. There are a lot of two, there are a lot of for and against arguments, etc. I am not going to pin any timeline on it. And the PH taxis, can you address that? All right, I mean, there's an ongoing criminal investigation. Well, I can tell you all about this current example. It has nothing to do with any PH taxi. The PH taxi system, the Prime Minister said, and I think it has also been said in public, is being addressed by the Ministry of Works and Transport, who that falls under. They were getting special advice, looking at it, working with the Attorney General. I'll wait the outcome of that. That doesn't fall under my purview. All I can do is caution and ask people to be very, very careful out there. We have a lot of sick people in our society, as far as I'm concerned. And I find it very disheartening, upsetting, to see a, a young woman be subjected to this type of criminal activity and behavior. And I wish there was some easy fix and some easy way to protect all of our young women in our, in our society. And um, I'm really hoping for a positive outcome in this case. And I've been in continuous contact with our Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. I asked the Defense Force to get out there and to assist them. Our intelligence service has been being playing a part from very early o'clock. Minister Young, earlier today I would have sent you some questions regarding the Google's um, ELS service, which is Emergency Location Services. Mm -hmm. um, is there any consideration? I don't know about the system. I haven't seen them. As I say, decisions can't be made in the, in the middle of a very emotional time. Um, I, I'm not sure what that type of system is. I think it is something where online and, and, and Google offers it or something that you can have an emergency. So basically what it is, is when you call the police, once you place an emergency, a call to an emergency number, they, they would use the, um, Google basically sends your location to the police. So it gives a faster response time to emergency providers. Okay, well that's something worthwhile for the authorities to take a look at. Minister, you made mention of a report that's, that needs that, to This is the last, last one. It may not be. Um, you made mention of a report. Okay, I'm taking two more questions, go on. You made mention of the report that needs to be laid and, and whatnot and whatnot. You don't a want to rush it. The report that needs to be laid? No, no. I didn't report, mention any report that needs to be laid. Regarding the pepper spray, that okay, let me, let me You see, I now understand how quickly information gets misassimilated. I never said anything about any report being laid. I was asked a question about pepper spray. I said that a government does, this government doesn't make decisions on the hoof in a vikey vai fashion. What I've done is I asked experts for a report that can guide the policy. I've now received that report. The National Security Council will consider the report and will presumably make a decision. And it's not to be rushed. Correct. So I don't know where laid, not laid right. came into that. That was the point I was getting at. Um, in the interim, before this report becomes or makes its way into becoming policy, how can we protect our women? And that's one of the questions that they have been asking for. We are waiting on, on all of this to happen. And in the right. meantime, 
their ladies being kidnapped and worse unfortunately around the world criminality and crime takes place that that's not unique to trinidad and tobago i mean i was seeing a very very sickening and, and unfortunate incident that took place in for example jamaica a few days ago in a church service with a woman in a church service all right so there is no magic wand there's no silver bullet there's nothing you can do say give women or vulnerable men or vulnerable people in our society this including a firearm and they will be able to protect themselves etc i don't operate in that manner what i've said is i've asked for a report i've received the report the report will be considered this is with respect to one non lethal item which is pepper spray and and a determination will be made with that i don't know if pepper spray is or is not is certainly not the magic wand solution it certainly is one tool that can be used but i am not going to prejudge anything or get drawn into that i've outlined the course of action that we're going to take and we'll follow that Yes. Thanks. I, I didn't identify myself earlier. It's Kim Bodram from the Express, and I'm going to try not to be too winding. You made mention of a lot of sick people in society. So <coughs> the police have to go out there and police, but they can only police so much. And as National Security Minister, you have to rely, obviously, on people within the prisons, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to micromanage certain things. But where are these people coming from? Why are they the way they are? Because we seem to be seeing a prevalence, unless it's just my perception, um, of these random violent crimes, opportunistic crimes. It means that someone made a decision in a moment to do this. What happens to these people, assuming the justice system has worked and someone is convicted of something like this? Are they asked where they came from? What could have caused this? What would have caused you to make this spur of the moment decision? Because Again, unless it's my skewed perception, I mean, as National Security Minister, you, you are probably bordering a, a culture that's borderline misogynistic. So talking about... I am probably what? Battling a culture okay, that is borderline misogynistic. I am ordering. Misogy <laughs> misogynistic. I mean, to say, let's protect women, etc. It's coming from the inside. What's your question, Kim? How are we addressing... Are we f what do we do to find out where these people come from and how we could stop producing them? Unfortunately, every society in the world is made up of a, a variety of people. Some who don't conform to our social norms and what's expected of them. There are no more questions after this one. One of the things I was doing prior to COVID coming in to address exactly what you've addressed is we need to start a conversation and building out policies to deal with mental health. And where does mental health fit into the whole dealing with crime element and we had found an expert i can't remember doctor from saint kitts and nevis had actually had the conversation i think the prime minister had spoken about it and he was actually going to come here in april of last year for us to begin a caricom discussion about how mental health mel mental wellness fits in to dealing with crime and criminality i think we need to do that type of work when persons go into the prison system Yes, you could have questions and ask them what it is, etc. But it's not that simple. So all I can say at this stage is I am a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago. And um, we have some persons out there that leave a lot to be desired. And I certainly will do all that I can in terms of policy to provide more protection, if that is possible, for women in society. Okay? Thank you all, all very much. Take care. That was a media conference by National Security Minister Stuart Young to update on security matters of national interest. You can tune into TTT, Talk City 91.1 FM, Sweet 100.1 FM, Next 99.1 FM, and on Facebook at TTT Live Online for all your updates. I'm DK Rasta. Bye for now. <laughs>